Welcome back to the All Things Narrative Podcast for part two of Why We Love Studio Ghibli, where we will look at the second half of Miyazaki's filmography, and it is going to be a wonderful conversation. Before I jump into that, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot with storytelling is that we are all influenced by stories and storytellers are influenced by different things as well. So like when we're talking about Miyazaki, we, uh, y- you got to talk about at some point Shinto, which is the Japanese kind of a uh, folk cultural, not quite a religion, but kind of, uh, where you have this idea that every, every, uh, creature, everything has sort of a life and a spirit to it as well, and that we should honor that. So being able to understand that everything has a context, including you, including your own life, is so important. And so at All Things Narrative, that's what we try to do is not just to tell stories, but tell stories rooted in context and to help you tell your life story uh, in a way that brings about a, a rich context uh, that others can better understand you through. And, you know, you might be thinking, oh, I just don't know. You know, maybe you're you're younger and you're like, man, is, my, is the story that I'm living really worthwhile? Is it worth telling and worth investing in? One of the things that I love and ver- I'm very influenced by with Miyazaki's life is this idea of being coming um, the sage, the wise sage of sort, right? Because in our culture, we cling to the young genius model of things where it's like, okay, we just want to be the young prodigy who just, you know, has strikes it big and has this amazing break in life very early on. But what I appreciate about Miyazaki's life is that it doesn't work that way. It's through a lot of hard work that he has to put in and we're not even seeing the fruits of what his work is capable of until he's in his 40s and 50s and 60s and beyond. So seeing him really hone in on his craft. And I believe that when we have an understanding of our lives as our life stories as unfolding in that way, that we're all working towards something, I believe that we can be more intentional and have more peace and contentment um, with where we are at um, while pushing as well to go where we want to in life. So at All Things Narrative, we do this through coaching programs, through workshops and classes, and through this podcast. And so check out allthingsnarrative.com. And if you are on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, connect with us there as well. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And yeah, let's go ahead and jump right back into this discussion. Here we go. Hello, and welcome to the All Things Narrative Podcast, where we explore the relationships between the stories we love and the stories we live. I'm your host, Derek Hatch, and let's get started. So the next one I want to talk about is kind of a wild card here, because Miyazaki technically did not direct this film, but he did write it, and he produced it. Um, And this was kind of a... He he was very inspirational uh, in getting this film to Ghibli. And so this is Whisper of the Heart. So Whisper of the Heart is very much like a slice of life type of film. Yes. Um, Very slow. I don't even want to say leisurely. I actually think this film is slow. And I think that's actually one of its faults um, is that there's almost not enough that happens. Mm -hmm. Um, At least for me. I think that's why I like it because... Once again, you don't have to explain it when you're watching it with your kids. Like, you can just sit down and watch it with them. Yeah. And, you know, you don't have to, you don't get all the questions of like, wait, what's happening? What's going on? Like, it's a very much like, you can see what's going on. You can really feel and see where the characters are coming from. Right. Without getting distracted by all these other things. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's true. This is what he uh, what he says here in his little statement. He says, the film will represent the type of challenge issued by a bunch of middle-aged men who have lots of regrets about their own youth. Um, this challenge to today's young people who will attempt to stimulate a spiritual thirst and convey the importance of yearning, an aspiration to an audience that tends to give up too easily on being the stars of their own stories. Our film will boldly attempt to sing the praises of life's beauty, wholesomeness so powerful it could blow away reality, might whisper of the heart be this. So again, another film directed towards young people. On paper, 
this should be my favorite Ghibli film. Story about a, a character, loves music. Uh, at, you know, um, you've got Seiji, right, who wants to be an aspiring violin maker. And then you've got Shizuku, who loves stories and writing and their connection, right? They want to push each other to be better at their art, but they also want to be there for each other in the midst of it. On paper, this should be my favorite Ghibli film in so many ways. Uh, it's got some great, uh, the the fantasy su- sequences where we get to see what's kind of going on in Shizuku's head as she's developing the story, right? I actually thought that was going to be more of the movie. I actually thought that we were going to kind of see these like gleams of inspiration throughout the film and see the story develop through anim- through these fantasy sequences. So for me, you don't quite get enough of what I was hoping to get out of the film. I think it spends too much time on boy-girl drama. Again, I'm not the target audience. You know, This is a film that if I was 14 and I had this film, this would have been my favorite film. This is perfect for when you're that 14, 15 years old. You're artsy and you've you've got a boy-girl drama all the time. This is perfect for that age range, right? Um, I do think Kiki does this film better in a sense. Like the themes, the ideas, I think it does it a little better. Um, but I think Whisper of the Heart, it's it's easily another, like I despite all my criticism, it still is a top-tier Ghibli film, you know? Yeah, despite, I guess you could say it's fault, it's still better than a lot of the movies out there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Know? I think for, this for is... For movies that you can watch with your kids, this is better than 75% of them. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think I think it's a great film. It actually was... Um, Miyazaki passed on, produce, on directing it, and he uh, wanted to bring, um, who was uh, supposed to be his successor, um, Yoshifumi Kondo. Um, and so he directed the film. I think he did a good job too. Mm-hmm. I think the film is very well directed and made. I just like the theme of it. Like that's what I like most about yeah. this movie is the fact that like you can be passionate about something that doesn't mean you're good at it. Yes. Well, and, and it that doesn't if, mean that you should give up. Yes. Because you're not good at it. Exactly. It means yeah, you're passionate about something. Well, you still have to put the work to continue to develop that. Right. That skill or that task or whatever it is. Yeah. It's really nice because I feel like a lot of a lot of current movies mm-hmm. and movies are like, oh, you're just talented, so you're amazing. And by the end of the film, they're amazing at it. And by the end of the film, they're amazing at it. Where this one, they're not. Yeah, this they're one you still... really get to see the struggle to yeah. make something. And even at the end of the film, like, see, a lot of people don't like the ending. I actually do really like the ending, even though it's incredibly abrupt. It's very, these these yeah, endings it, it, are very ooh very rushed they 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 kind of get to a point where like okay this movie needs to be done so let's wrap it up so these endings tend to be rushed um pretty quickly but i love the idea that um shizuku and seiji are both finding these challenges in pursuing their arts seiji decides that he wants to be all in uh in pursuing shizuku which is why he gives this like marriage proposal at the end Mm -hmm. which is like silly but i also think it's cute and endearing because it's kind of like i get what you're trying to say you're trying to say that despite the challenges we face and we will face in these past because there's a great speech from suzuku's parents about how if you choose this kind of life you're going to have challenges are you ready to accept that and seiji's just kind of like i'm he i i will be with you i will be the stable commit committing thing in this hard life we're choosing. So I like that. I think that's cool. Yeah, I wish for the heart is great. Um, it does pretty well as well. It's very, very, very good success as well for the studio. Um, unfortunately, it is a film that is marked a little bit by tragedy because, um, so Yoshifumi Kondo gets to direct this film because Miyazaki is busy at work at another film. So in 1994, he ends the Nazca manga to begin work full-time on the project that he has been building his whole career to, which of course is Princess Mononoke. And in 1995, he's working on it, and Yoshifumi Kondo, once he finishes Whisper the Heart, he becomes the lead um, overseer of the animation. That's how much Miyazaki trusts him is that he allows him to oversee the animation 
process. I'm letting go. Even though Miyazaki, no, Miyazaki still He's not letting go. <laughs> personally inspects like more than half the cells oh of the film. But he really He's trusts trying. this guy. He's trying. To and at the end of the production, he dies. Was he young? He was only like, oh gosh. He's like in his like 40s. Oh geez, that's 46 awful. or something. Yeah. He dies of a brain aneurysm. Oh, that's terrible. Yes. And Miyazaki feels so guilty about it mm -hmm. that after Princess Mononoke is out, he announces he never wants to make a film again. Despite that tragedy, they made a great film. Because for me, Princess Mononoke is Ghibli's epic. epic masterpiece. Yes. So he had this idea all the way back uh, into the 70s. And he feels like he's ready to make this film at this point. He, and he also feels like Japan in the 90s is in a very um, tough place. You know, in the early 90s, there's this economic boom with consumerism that came from the West. And they think Japan is going to, like, have this whole new era. And it starts to crumble as we get through the 90s. So he's ready. He's ready to make this film. This is the film he's been waiting for. It's kind of like Whisper of the Heart. He's been developing his craft. He's been developing yeah. the well, storytelling. Well, and it's interesting because like uh, he really develops Whisper of the Heart and Prince Mononoke side by side mm -hmm. intentionally. Like mm -hmm. he wants Whisper of the Heart to be this more hopeful kind of story Yeah. about the world is tough, but just go for it yeah. and do the best you can. Mm -hmm. And Princess Mononoke, he was really trying to explore why is the world so tough? Mm -hmm. Why are we making this so hard on ourselves? So this is his uh, director statement uh, for Princess Mononoke here. He says, Princess Mononoke does not purport to solve the problems of the entire world. The battle between rampaging forest gods and humanity cannot end well. There can be no happy ending. Yet even amidst the hate and slaughter, there are things worthy of life. It is possible for wonderful encounters to incur and for beautiful things to exist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's essentially the film about uh, our protagonist, Ashitaka, right? Um, this, this takes place, by the way, this is the oldest film, like in terms of the time, time period, period takes place. Yeah. It's a mix of different time periods of like the... 12, 13, 1400s Japan, right? And you have Ashitaka from this like very rural village. Um, he gets this curse from trying to save a boar um, that was uh, turned into like a demon. Very graphic first scene. Immediately when you start this film, you realize you are not in the this same Ghibli Totoro. as Totoro. Yeah, <laughs> you are. It's almost shocking when you get to this film, when you watch it, right? Yeah, it doesn't feel like the same. The tone, the tone is, is very different. Yes. Um, there are heads that get chopped off. There yeah. are um, some terrible, viol people get stabbed. Um, it is immensely violent, but not in a glorifying crowd. It does not It is a very bleak, you know, um, take on violence. Um, but... Yeah, so Ashitaka um, has this curse, forces him to leave the village, and he learns as he leaves t home, he learns of this greater conflict between the, the, the forest um, and nature and um, humanity uh, via um, the iron the, both the ironworks town and the, um, the, the monks as well, right, who are on behalf of the emperor. You have all these different factions vying. They all want different things. Ashitaka is the mediator in the middle, really trying to hold everything together, trying to take the weight of everybody upon his shoulders. So he spends. We spend a lot of time in Iron Town with um, with Lady Aboshi, who I think is probably the best Ghibli antagonist. Because um, I don't even know if it's right to call her a full blown antagonist. Because. So she's creating um, the gun, the gunpowder, and the weapons that are destroying the forest and killing the animals, right? But what we find out in the village is that um, she is providing um, jobs for women um, so that they don't have to be um, in the brothel and be prostitutes. Well, and also all and, the lepers and the lepers, mm -hmm. yes, which is inspired by Miyazaki's real experience with with lepers. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually one of my favorite moments. Is when the leper um, has that speech that he gives to Ashitaka 
about defending Lady Eboshi and how she is the only one who actually sees them as human. And so you realize this conflict is not cut and dry. Um, you also spend a lot of time in the forest with uh, San, who's all, who is the Princess Mononoke, and that's kind of an insulting title that they give her um, because it's like, ooh, you're like the princess of the forest spirits you know like you're not human you're not human exactly um and she doesn't want to be human she denies her humanity mm -hmm. you know whereas lady eboshi is trying to help people embrace their humanity she's denying it because she's that in tune with nature and you know the wolves and all the different animals and you see that all these creatures they have you know like a spirit um there's a lot of time that we get to spend of uh, Ashitaka showing that compassion to San as well and her experiencing that love that she never got from another human being. And so he's, he's constantly trying to show um, hatred and what hatred is leading to. And we have this uh, very jarring design of the, the great forest spirit which when you look at it is very unsettling because it's probably my least favorite design, you know, but do I you can't know, think of anything so more. Do you know, do you know why, more... do you know why it's unsettling though? Cause I actually heard something that was very interesting. What? It's perfectly symmetrical. Okay. There's nothing in nature that's perfectly symmetrical. No, but, I don't think that's it. No, I mean, maybe, but like, no, it's, it's, when you think of a forest spirit, you just don't think of that. Yeah. I mean, it's a very creative design. I don't think um, creative is the word. I think <gasps> weird is the word. <laughs> well, nonetheless. It's just like, you're like thinking like it doesn't match the rest of the movie. I think that's the point, though. Is the, the point is I, that I it absolutely, match. I absolutely think that's the point. Because the great forest spirit, you know, brings about this healing, Right. And I love this idea. It's one of my favorite ideas in the whole film. I love this idea that when you kill, quote unquote, God, right? Because the forest spirit is kind of like the, the God among the gods of the film. So when you kill God, chaos erupts. Um, and there's, a, there's definitely some commentary going on in this film about... Um, leaving behind the spiritual, right? Because literally you have the, the emperor who want to kill God so that the emperor can be have immortality, right? So this idea that man, it's like a Tower of Babel, like let us replace mm -hmm. that which is highest and so we can put ourselves on top. And when we do that, of course, chaos ensues. And despite the chaos, when... Um, when um when they realize the error of their ways and they return the head, healing comes about. So even though the forest spirit no longer dwells among them, what they learn from the forest spirit, they begin to cultivate. And that's how the film ends, right? With this message of, well, Lady Eboshi's still going to do her thing. San's going to still do her thing. The conflict is not solved, but at least... We can be better. We can we can be more mindful of each other, right? Yeah. Did they turn that one into like a big manga thing too? No. Really? Because no. That seems like the story is not over when it's over. No. Nausicaa, again, is like the kind of the early seeds for Mononoke. So Mononoke really is meant to be a film first and foremost, and that's it. Gotcha. So, but... um. But yeah, Mononoke, it's important to talk about as well with it that um, uh, Dis they made a deal with Disney overseas that Disney was going to begin distributing their films. Disney was expecting Totoro, like that type of film. So when they get handed Princess Mononoke, they freak out and they go, we can't release this under Disney. We cannot release this under Disney. But I got to tell you something really ironic, though, real quick, is that um, who do you think is target audiences for this? Say like young adult. That's what I would think too. Yeah. He actually didn't know for a long time as he was making what his target audience was going to be. When he finished the film, he said, I know who needs to see this. Elementary school kids. What? Yep. 
So do tell why. <laughs> I will tell you why. And this actually is a, a, a larger view that Miyazaki has about um, not sheltering children. That's a big theme in a lot of what he talks about is that you should not shelter children from the realities of, of the world. Mm -hmm. He doesn't believe in traumatizing children, mm -hmm. but he believes that if this is what the world is really like, you need to, to tell them, you know, in some way. He has this whole thing about blood, um, for example, where he says, like, we can't teach children to, like, be be afraid of looking at blood mm -hmm. because, you know, so it's like you have that really graphic moment in Spirited Away where the dragon's bleeding out, but yeah. you have Chihiro trying to help bandage him, right? Yeah. She And so his whole thing is, like, uh, I don't want kids to, like, freak out and shield themselves from pain. Mm -hmm. I want a kid to be able to learn how to deal with pain both when they experience it and when others deal with it. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah, so there's this idea that he has in general about just not trying to shy away children from things. He also is kind of of the opinion like children don't have to fully understand something the first time they see it, mm -hmm. um, that they could come back in repeated viewings over time and kind of get a feel for it. But... Nonetheless, despite Miyazaki claiming that children could handle this film, Disney in the West said that cannot happen. Disney did decide that they would release this under their adult company, Miramax. And of course, um, the head of Miramax at the time was good old Harvey Weinstein of hashtag Me Too fame. So um, he was notorious for editing and cutting things, mm -hmm. um, butchering films. So... There's the famous story of Miyazaki and Suzuki sending Weinstein and Miramax a package. And he opens up the package and he sends them a sword with a little note attached to it saying, no cuts. Classic Miyazaki right there. We're threatening you, but not really. Yes. Here's a gift. No it cuts. <laughs> yeah. So um, Miyazaki basically kind of low key threatened him to not make any changes to his movie. And he respected that. And Neil Gaiman, the famous comic book writer, um, actually oversaw the English dub, um, which is why I think it's one of the best dubs, um, because it was written by someone who is well versed in this fantasy genre. Absolutely critical acclaim in Japan. It is the first animated film in Japan to win Best Picture. America, it doesn't do that well. America's not ready for it. It's not ready. No, <laughs> America's still not ready for Ghibli yet. Um, Wait, what year was this? 1997. Okay. Um, it actually was the highest grossing film of all time in Japan until a few months later when another film was released. Spirited Away? Titanic. Ah, wait, what? Yeah, 97. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Titanic actually surpassed Mononoke as the highest grossing film at that time. But nonetheless, after Mononoke, Miyazaki wants to retire. This guy's always trying to retire. Always trying to retire, yep, after <laughs> every film. But then um, Takahata is making a film um, after Prince of Mononoke called My Neighbor the Yamadas. And because they have to switch the animation style, the Ghibli staff gets burnt out. And the company is in a good place, but the staff is not really, they're, they're tired at this point. And so Miyazaki is like, you know, let's make another film kind of in our classic Ghibli style. And um, I'm going to come out of retirement to do it. And Was he retired for two weeks? Um, well, I don't know. <laughs> what I do know is that it was a little 10-year-old girl that inspired him. Um, mm -hmm. So when he took family vacations, um, there would be these young girls, um, family friends that... He saw the wonder they had in life, but also the challenges they were having in navigating life. And so he really wanted to make a film for that Did age he have group. daughters? I think he just had a son. I don't oh. think he had any daughters. But yeah, so... Maybe that's a good thing. Too much pressure. Too much you pressure. You the daughter. Yeah. And he's got all these epic hero right. heroines. That would, be, that would be a lot of pressure right. if you were a young girl. Yeah, Disney is 100% behind this film. Um, they 
really, really want this film to be big in America. They believe it's going to be big. What to, one? Um, and that's Spirited Away. And Spirited Away is incredibly Japanese. It doesn't seem like an it, American yeah. thing. At first, it doesn't seem like it's going to blow up in America, right? And it um, probably doesn't. It's very, huh? very Japanese. Um, it actually does. Nope. This is finally the moment where Ghibli makes it in America. Like, they really make it big. They make it so big that um, they win the Academy Award. Really? Um, yes. It's the only Ghibli film to ever win an Oscar. But not the only one to ever be nominated, though, as we'll see. Um, but it, it's, it's explosive. This is the film that brings Ghibli onto the world stage. Spirit Away has gone on to become, um, not just considered one of the greatest animated films, but one of the greatest films of all mm-hmm. time. This was his proposal with it. This is supposed to be the story of a young girl who's thrown into another world where good and bad people are coexisting. In this world, she undergoes rigorous training, learns about friendship and self-sacrifice, and using her own basic smarts, somehow not only manages to survive, but manages to return to our world. Yet just as our ordinary world has not completely disappeared, she has returned, not by vanishing evil, vanquishing evil in the other world, but as a result of having learned a new way to live. About a girl, a film ultimately about young girls figuring out their identities and responsibilities. So what do you think of Spirited Away, another film that people crown as Miyazaki's masterpiece? I mean, I feel like with Spirited Away, you have to watch it a few times to understand what's going on. Yes. Um, because there's so much. So it's very s- stimulating. Like you yeah, have all these creatures not, you don't there's recognize. There's so many creatures. There's so many symbols. There's so many... Um, this is the king of symbolism. <laughs> yes. Well, and there's so many things that like I've only learned because you have said, oh, that's a Japanese, you know, symbol of this or this is a, yes. this is a way of portraying You need this. like a cultural like, you, dictionary you a cultural to interpret dictionary this movie. dictionary for this one if you grew up in America like I did. Um, so, but that doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it like first round. I think I was more confused first round. Yeah. Versus when That's I watched fair. Kiki or Totoro, it was like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah. Um, it's a very straightforward story, right? She's with her family. They're, they're, they go She's into this. She's annoying in the beginning and yep. she grows out of it. You yeah. know, like it's very yeah, much her that Her parents type of turn story. into pigs. They're cursed now. And oh, she has to pigs. figure out how to deal with that by taking a job, you know, in the spirit world, which that, that, all, that alone, that idea, they're so symbolic. It's this idea that this generation has failed. And so the younger generation has to figure it out on their own, right? That's essentially what he's trying to say yeah. there. Well, and it, it's also saying that, like, when you're, even though she's young, what is she, like, 10 or something? Yeah, 10. Yeah, like, even though you're young, like, you don't get to just, like, complain. Like, you kind of have to suck it up because yep. your parents are not going to baby you anymore. Yep. And you need to kind of suck it up and realize there's a big world out there and figure out how you're going to survive in it. Yeah. Um. So it's kind of like the, not the opposite, but it's like the... She has to almost lose her not innocent, pure kind of view of the world and realize that things are murky and things are Maybe not naive. easy. Yeah, and the naive, no, whatever that word is. Yeah. Um, like she has to kind of like learn to like grow up in order to have a place. Yeah. Um, and if she doesn't grow up, she won't have a place and she won't be able to return back to her, um, parents and return right. back. She has to grow up and she has to step in where no one else is going to step in for her. Nobody's going to like baby her. Right. And she has right. to learn that lesson kind of the hard way. Yeah. Yes. I, and I, I would agree with all that as well. Your parents aren't going to fight your battles for you. Right. Cause yeah. Which I think is a good thing for for kids to yeah. learn. She definitely has a great arc. Great mm-hmm. arc in the film. Yeah. And I think um there's so much going on. There really there's is a on on a lot on. of levels. Like literally after we watched the film the first time, which you weren't really a fan of the first time. You you I, was just too I remember you saying that that was probably your least favorite Ghibli film the first time you saw it. Yeah. And then I like would try to be like, "Hey, did you know that like no face. There's this idea of like not having an identity because identity is a big part of it. You know, you have no face who has no identity and he's trying to attach himself to an identity. Chihiro's risk of losing her identity um, with Yubaba, right? And there's this idea of like selling who you are out. Um, and then you have Haku who's forgotten who he is and needs to be reminded. So identity is like the yeah, major it's theme like you, in there's this. There's a lot to it. You yeah. just need 
you need to watch it a couple times to actually understand it. Like you need that kind of cultural dictionary type. Thing. Right. Um, yeah. So. Lots of great scenes. The stink spirit scene. It's always a good oh, one. That one always is good. Yeah. Lots of, I mean, there's some environmental commentary there, there as well. Is some and then you know? also once again, like nobody's going to fight this battle for you. You kind of have to step up yep. and go for it. Um, yeah. Which I think is good. Cause I think even a lot of young adults, even people our age, Still haven't learned that lesson. Right. Absolutely. You know, like you, no one's going to do something for yeah. you. If you want something like you need to kind of step it up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Miyazaki is definitely advocates for, for that approach. Well, and I think in a lot of these films, he advocates that children are capable of more than we give them. Credit yes. For. Yes. Yes. That is the perfect way to sum up how he views all this. It doesn't mean we should take away their innocence and it doesn't mean we should like, you know, yeah. make their lives miserable and make them work hard all the yeah. time. But it is saying that children are much more, they're humans. And sometimes they feel like we forget that. We just think they're like these little annoying right. things, but really they're, yeah. they're their own persons and they're, they have value and they can have input and they have something. And, to bring. and this is, and this is a film that like, uh, you know, our oldest daughter has seen it. She's, she's too young for it. She doesn't understand but it. But she's seen it anyways, so it's kind of like, oh, well, like at this point, like she's seen it. She's not terrified we of it. We just had to pause it too many times to where it's not a fun movie to watch with her. Yeah, but I think she's interested in it, you know? Like I do think that when she, as she gets a little older, these this film will really resonate with her in a lot of ways. I also really like in this film and in all the Ghibli films, they usually have this moment of like a calm where there's really nothing that happens and it just allows you, the audience, to breathe after something intense, right? So I think of like Chihiro No Face on the train and you just kind of, there's just, you're just on a train with them. And there's like no dialogue or nothing. You just kind of get to take in like, wow, there's a lot that's happened in this movie. Let me sit and soak it in, you know? Um, yeah, there's a lot going on, a lot of atmosphere, magical moments too. Um, Haku and Chihiro in the sky, um, is a standout moment in any Ghibli film in terms of the, where the music, the animation, the character voice, where everything is just all firing on all cylinders. So even though it's not my favorite Ghibli film, it easily is another top tier film. I understand if it is your favorite. Um, I totally get that. And, um, I think it's a film that'll be around for a long time. I think people will continue to resonate with it um for a long long time and yeah it's a film i want to do an analysis on too because there's so much going on to talk about uh that and mononoke i think there's so much you can dissect so and um so there's only a few more left that we re we're really going to tackle here um we'll, we do these ones a little briefer so um we got howl's moving castle next so i could not find a director statement for this one and maybe it's because Miyazaki was not supposed to be the director because he retired after Spirited Away. He's always retiring. <laughs> always retiring. So he retired after this, and he actually got a different director, an outside director, to come and try to make House Moving Castle. Now, Miyazaki, eventually, um, he really liked this story, and he eventually um, didn't think that the director, the director who was going to make it, their vision was too different. They were too far apart in what they wanted to do. He couldn't let it go. He couldn't let it go. <laughs> so the, they gracefully parted ways. That director has actually said that was the best thing that ever happened to him mm. because he learned to not to be influenced by Miyazaki but not recreate Miyazaki. So he went on after this to create another film called The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. Oh, I like that one. Yes. Oh. And after the success of The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, he made another film called Wolf Children. I like that one, too. Yep. So there you go. Oh. This guy has a pretty good career ahead of him, right? Yeah. Um, nice. Pretty good career um, post uh, not getting to do Howl's Moving Castle. But yeah, so Howl's Moving Castle is interesting because Miyazaki is... Um, this is, uh, he begins incorporating computer um, animation. It also looks more steampunky. Like, yeah, he goes like back very, to the steampunk from Castle like, in the um, Sky. It's not, it's very clean. 
It's very clean. It is yeah. computer cleaned up. Yeah, yes. computer cleaned up. And That's he good... did, Mononoke introduced a little bit of that. Spirited Away has more of that. This has the most um, computer very um, polished. out of any Ghibli film they've done. It's very polished looking. It's, I mean, the castle, you know, um, lots of computer stuff used to make the castle move. Um, but it's, um, it's a gorgeous film. I mean, it really is. A I think some of the other ones are more pretty, but yeah, he's very critical of America's involvement in the Iraq war. And so from this point on, he wants to make films that will bomb in America. He no longer wants to try to appease a Western audience with any of his films. So Howl's Moving Castle is a film that he is hoping will do terrible in America. Nice. Um, the basic premise of it, I'll read the basic premise real quick. When Sophie, a shy young woman, is cursed with an old body by a spiteful witch, her only chance of breaking the spell lies with a self-indulgent yet insecure young wizard, Howl, and his companions in this legged walking castle. So... There's just so many good characters. Yes, I was just about like, to say. I just smile this, when I think about this. This might be the this. best set of characters in any Ghibli film. They're just, this combination of it's characters. It's such a good combo. This is what you come for. This is like a film where it's not really about the story. It's not. It's about It's the just characters. vibing with these characters. You've like, got, they're funny. They're you've got Sophie, funny. who manages to be even more amazing and charming when she's older, when she's right? When she's old, yeah, compared to when she's young and shy. Yep. Um, then you've got the boy. Um, I forget the boy's name, the kid. Yeah, he, um, he's in training to be a To be a wizard, wizard yep. You've got Howl, who has so much character. Oh, he's such a he's charming, but also grump. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, you've got Calcifer. He's my um, favorite. Yeah, Calcifer he's he's a favorite fan favorite for sure. And he's not even um, a like a like he's a character, but he's fire. Yep, he's he just the, fire. He's fire. He's just peace fire. He's he's, yep. a, he's a fire that just wants to be yep. fed wood. Yep. It's great. And it's great. It's I so just great. love Calcifer. Yep. And um, my favorite is Turniped. Well, the little scarecrow that little can't scarecrow say anything. That can't say but anything, it's just so but sweet. And amazing and that kind. you could have a scarecrow who literally doesn't speak is a character. A great character. And a great too. character. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Howl's Moving Castle is. And even the witch, the other witch, you know, she's. Yes. Like, the, the way that, you know, she's like. You know, her walking the steps like she can't uh, use magic. She can't use magic to and get And Sophie's to the just steps. like, come on, Slowpoke. Yeah, like, exactly. They're just like. <laughs> this This might oh, be the so funniest funny. Ghibli of Miyazaki's I film. I think so. I think it is um, the funniest I one. think maybe not even intentionally funny, but in terms of just the, the little interactions. Yeah. Um, so do you think this movie did well in America? It probably did. Despite Miyazaki not wanting it to. It probably did well. This movie did really good in America. And it was a perfect storm of things that made it. So this came out at the height of the fantasy film boom of Lord of the Rings okay. and Harry Potter, yeah. right? As all those were coming out, this came out right there in 2004, 2005 mm -hmm. as those movies were coming out. Um, it also was very clearly anti-war, which was very big in America, right? Well, of that the was criticism big, of the war. Not just among adults, but teens. Yeah, right. Like, there was a lot This of is a movie that w with youth culture yeah, really very, exploded. Yeah, youth culture. That's what yeah. I'm thinking of. Like, because... Um, really connected with it because right. a lot of these youth were looking at the war going i don't i don't want to get right. drafted yeah and that and, was and, a real topic back then right and know? how and how is very like just his character of how like he doesn't want to he, he he doesn't want to take a side and every time he engages in the war he loses a little bit of his humanity right mm -hmm. by turning into that bird thing mm -hmm. a little more so um and how is very emo Yes. And the, that's the height of emo, like yeah. the emo subculture. The emo subculture devoured this movie. Before I knew anything about Ghibli, I knew about this movie because all my emo friends were obsessed with it. And they uh, all the girls wanted to marry Howl. They thought he was a misunderstood, like... Oh, my gosh. Yeah. He so, would be a terrible husband. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, Unless he grows up. Yeah. So this movie was huge. Um, and again... It's just a great film to, film to just chill out, vibe with the characters. And it's, laugh. Yeah. Like, really? It is, it, when you get to the second half, it is a little confusing. I, it did take me a couple watches to fully understand, understand what, what was, was happening. It is very muddy, um, but 
it, like whereas Spirited Away, like the execution is so tight and flawless in how it's telling its story. Um, here it takes a little more time. Once again, it's not so, about the story; it's about the characters. It really is. So, so um, now after House Moving Castle, um, he gets in a bit of tiff with his son um, over Tales from Earthsea. So I don't think it's that terrible. I don't as think people it's make that it out terrible. To yeah, everyone but, said it was an awful movie, but when we watched it, we were like, "Oh, right." But awful on Ghibli standards, I guess. But if yeah. you look at all the trash that gets put right, out there, exactly. it's really not bad at all. But he wanted to uh, make a film that could go back to kind of this more childlike wonder mm-hmm. that of the Totoro days. Mm-hmm. Um, but he he said that he could not make something as innocent as Totoro ever again. He thought the world was too bleak. Hence why Ponyo. So hence why Ponyo has these world ending stakes thrown in. Yeah. You know, randomly. Mm-hmm. Um, he said there has to be some sort of tension and, and potential consequence. Mm-hmm. Like it can't just be all hunky dory. Um it's not like Totoro was perfect hunky dory either. Right. So but um so Miyazaki did retire after House. Really? Yes. For real. Yes. But okay. he comes back um <laughs> what? with um with Ponyo because um Shizuki, the producer, said, you should really make a kid's film. And he said, the only way I'll make another film is if no computers are involved. So Ponyo goes back to 100% hand-drawn animation. Mm -hmm. Um, This is the most cells, I think, in any Ghibli film um, because it is completely hand-drawn. How long did it take to make? Um, I mean, it took a few years. Yeah. He, and again, he's very hands-on. He does a lot of these himself. He's very inspired by Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid when wanting to make it. He wanted him... This was his challenge here. This was his director's statement here. A small cast of characters, the ocean as a living presence, a world where magic and alchemy are accepted as part of the ordinary. A little boy and a little girl, love and responsibility, the ocean and life, these things that which is most element uh, to them are depicted in the most basic way. This is my response to the afflictions and uncertainty of our times. So this is a film that if you're an adult and you're trying to analyze it too hard, it's just not going to work for you. Mm -hmm. Like you're like, okay, so Ponyo can go back between being human and Mer goldfish thing. Okay. Two kids out alone on a boat that Ponyo can blow up a toy boat. What mother leaves a like five year old? It's Miyazaki. That's who is. He is the mother in that movie easily. Well, I'm sure but, he wouldn't have left his five year old. I actually wouldn't put it past him. Oh my God. Um, but yeah, so it's very um, delightful and innocent. Um, you've got the great sequence that uh, our kids love of Ponyo eating ham. <laughs> Ghibli food looks so good, right? Um, but they make yeah. a bowl of ramen and they put the ham in it, ham and egg, right? Well, and it shows the delight kids have in simple things. Yep, exactly. Uh, the, the wow of simple things and waiting mm-hmm. for the food to cool down Burning and the anticipation. Yeah. You know, of just like the, the mother and the son, like eating ice cream together, just enjoying simple things in life. Or just the mom, like, you know, like, you know how he's doing the light signals to the dad on the boat? Oh, yeah. And she's know? all, like, frustrated. And she's all mad. And she's, like, muttering under his breath, you know? Right. And he's, like, trying to communicate. Yeah. And she's just like, yeah. So Yeah. Ponyo, this is top tier um, gorgeous animation. This is easily some of the best animation, especially with the, the ocean um, and the water and all the creatures that they do. It's just very pretty to look at. It's um, not my style. Yeah, it is. There okay. is a certain style they're going for. Yeah, with a, it they too. do the style well. It's it's not my preferred yeah. visual. No, I get that. Um, I also really love this score. Yeah, especially the great. opening first five ten minutes where there's no dialogue and it's just music and it's mm-hmm. got that like opera voice and stuff. Yep. Yeah, and it's like the little it puts like our kids to sleep. Every time yeah. I play it in the car. But they love the Ponyo theme song they at the love, end, right? They love all of the music. But once it gets to that one with the opera, if I put the one that yeah. it's like that slow, beautiful thing, oh, it just lulls them to sleep in the car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ponyo, Ponyo is great. It is, it is just a charming little film. 
Um, yeah, but it's also not, um, it's not one of my favorites. Same, same here. It's definitely not one of my favorites. And it's definitely, um, I want to say preachy, but it's a lot more um, on the nose. Yeah, there's with definitely the that on the nose. And um, stuff like yes, that. Yes, absolutely. Which I'm, it's not that I'm against that. It's just not as subtle. No, it's, a it's lot not more, subtle. Um, in your face Mm -hmm. um, for this story in particular. Right. Well, and it's important to note that Japan, I can't remember if it's before or after Ponyo, there's like a giant tsunami. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, I think Ponyo was banned for like a year on Japanese television because of because of the tsunami that it was too triggering for people. So it was actually banned of all the Ghibli movies. Ponyo. It was banned um, for like a year from being on television uh, or something like that. But yeah, so we get to Miyazaki's final film, at least for now. He is working on another one that um, is taking a long time to complete. But um, for now, his final film is The Wind Rises. This is his least fantastical, I think it's fair to say. Um, it's actually based on two real historical figures that he merges into one character, Jiro, um, the person who designed um, the the Japanese airplane um, that was eventually used in Pearl Harbor and in World War II, and of a real-life character who fell in love with a, uh, a young lady who was diagnosed with tuberculosis. So, like, the romance is inspired by one character, one real-life person, and then the airplane stuff, another, and he merged those together. Because that actually is kind of the story of his parents. So his father was a um, was a designer of, of of planes and stuff mm-hmm. for for Japan during the war, mm-hmm. and his mother had tuberculosis. So he actually it's very meta, you know. Mm-hmm. There's actually a very meta scene in this movie. So one of the standout scenes in The Wind Rises is the um, the earthquake scene, right? Where he kind of gives the the personification to the to nature and this earthquake and you see that there's a a a woman struggling and jiro goes to help that woman right when miyazaki was a child um and they were fleeing an air bomb or like sorry they were fleeing like a bombing raid uh in their in their area and they were trying to get away and there was a, a a mother and her child that were crying out for help. And Miyazaki's uh, family said, we have to keep going. We can't go back for them. Mm. That memory haunted Miyazaki for the rest of his life. Yeah. And you actually see him dealing with that mm-hmm. um, in almost every film in some way. The survivor's guilt of Porco. Yeah. Um, and you see it here in The Wind Rises too where you have Jiro not keep going but go back for them, right? Yeah. It's almost like he was doing he wishes that's what, what he happened. wishes could have happened. Oh, but he must have been young. He was four. He was four years old? He's, he remembers it though. Wow. He still remembers that. And he remembers... Is that why he feels like he's cursed? I don't know. Be interesting. Um, but yeah, but he's always had an obsession with flight. All these movies have standout flying sequences. Yeah. Um, this is the movie that deals with it the most. But he also sees that flight, like everything, is a gift, but it's also a curse, right? Yeah. So there's this whole uh, dream sequences where it talks about that these are cursed dreams. So in fact, what he talks about with his kind of manifesto here is that I want to portray a devoted individual who pursued his dream head on. That really is the theme of the film, our dreams, you know? Yeah. Dreams possess an element of madness, and such poison must not be concealed. Yearning for something too beautiful can ruin you. Swaying towards beauty may come at a price. Jiro will be battered and defeated, his design career cut short. Nonetheless, Jiro was an individual, if preeminent, original, and talented. This is what we will strive to portray. The intention is not to condemn war, nor is it about trying to stir about young Japanese with the excellence of the Zero fighter plane. I have no plans to defend our lead character as saying that he actually wanted to make a civilian aircraft. I want to create something that's realistic fantastic and at times caricatured but as a whole a beautiful film so this is the most complex in terms of maybe how i feel about his films 
What do you think of Wind Rises? I mean, I really enjoyed The Wind Rises because it's very much a film that shows, I guess you could say how what you do, what your intentions are, Mm -hmm. can get changed and used for something you did not intend. Right. Or even if you did intend it that way, someone can take it and turn it into something you never imagined. Yes, and, and I, you still go through with it. And exactly. That's that's kind of the moral conflict that he's dealing with in all the dream sequences. Right. Um, where he's like, I just want to make beautiful planes. And I think his friend Ethan says at one point, he's like, our job is just to design. Our job is not to think about what they're going to do with it. Yeah. And and that he kind of back, back plays on his friend, I think, in that scene. And he's like... Yeah. Well, but we do, you know, and so you kind of see that confliction and it's kind of the idea of like, just do the best that you can and that's all you can do. It's kind of a push against that idea. Yeah. It's a, the idea that maybe you do have, maybe you do need to think a little bit more about what you're doing and what your intentions are. But once again, it's not condemning him at all. It's yeah. not saying what he's doing is wrong. It's not saying that yeah. he's a bad person because of what he did and what he created. It's just saying right. this is reality. Yeah. You don't get to choose where you were born in. Like I didn't choose to be born in America. I was just right. born here and I'm blessed by that. Right, right. Um, but if I was born in Japan during that time period and I happened to be an engineer, well, that's what that's what would do. happen. That's yeah. what would happen. Um yeah. and it's, it's I, and I do think I try to keep in mind as well watching this film, being American, like there is a certain distastefulness in, right. in maybe how the ending is handled from my perspective as an American, mm-hmm. just in terms of like, uh, I, I mean, always got the sense that he's almost more concerned about the planes than he was about what the planes have done to people. Yes. You know? Mm-hmm. And, um, just this kind of idea of like, uh, okay, well it's over. I'm just going to go drink some wine now. And that's the end of it. Mm-hmm. Um, which I, I get what he's trying to say. I get what he's trying to communicate. But yeah. It's that. a little uneasy. Like, like it's not resolved. May, and I think that is reading his statement makes me realize. I think that's the point of what he's trying to do. Yeah. It's kind of just go like, well, I don't know what to do now. I'm just going to go and have a drink and yeah, I don't know what to do. And I think that's, you know, this is definitely Miyazaki's most personal film. I think you definitely see he's, this is a film that he didn't even have any ambition to make. Um, he actually at, was contemplating after, he actually, after Ponyo didn't retire, I know it's shocking, he actually wanted to make a sequel uh, to Porco Rosso. Mm-hmm. But uh, he was talked out of it and said, you should make this film. You've You've been interested in this story for a long time. And it's the only time he's ever cried watching his own film. So it really, you know, it's very moving, I know, for him. From this point on with Howls and Ponyo and Wind Rise, all these movies do well, you know, globally. They do really well. Um, you know, Howls, Wind Rises, they both get nominated for Oscars. You know, they don't win. Yeah, there, there is a sense that when you get to Wind Rises, um, you feel like we've kind of come back to where we've started, but we're not the same. Like Nausicaa, this first film opens, starts off with this idea of the wind, right? And about the power of the wind trying to shape it, right? And then the wind rises also uses this wind motif, but very differently. And so this Ghibli really did blow a new wind into animation. And I think that's safe to say. I think so. And so to end with here, I want to end with just um, us maybe giving like a final recap of our rankings, favorites, least favorites. There's a lot of Ghibli films we didn't talk about. Do you just um, want to list some of the ones we didn't talk about? Because there's quite a few. Um, I'll do it with my rankings. Do you want me to go first or do you want to go first? No, I don't rank. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go first and then you could kind of give me your comments as well. All right. Sure. So with my rankings, I'll list even the non Miyazaki films in there and you could check out my full ranking on letterbox. If you want to see my notes, um, the themes, breaks, breakdowns, analysis, all that kind of stuff here. I'll, I'll include the link to that in the show notes. There are 22 Ghibli films, not 23. 
Earwig and the Witch does not exist. So Well, we haven't seen it. I tried to sit through it and I couldn't do it. Um, Ghibli never made a CG an- anime film. What? So I, I just could pretend that doesn't exist. So starting at number 22. Did Miyazaki not have his hand in Earwig? No, no nothing. 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 Nothing at all. His no. son? That that was his son. That was his son. Yeah. His poor son. Um, number 22, Ocean Waves, the TV movie. Um, it's the only Ghibli film that I actually would say is not worth watching. Not worth watching, but just mediocre to bad. Um, 21, My Neighbors, the Yamadas. Um, I didn't even make it through that one. You didn't even one. make it through That's that one. That's no. probably my least favorite. It's a film. Those two films I never would want to watch again. I have no desire. Every other film I'm about to say, I would at least go and watch again. Um, well, My Neighbors, the Yamadas. One, I don't like the animation. At yeah. All. Like, I don't yeah, like it's that style. Understandable. At all. Yeah. And two, the characters are just terrible. Yeah. Like, I'm just like, yeah. ugh, I yeah. don't even like any of you. Right. <laughs> so that that doesn't go for a good story. If you if one, you don't like the characters and two, yeah. you don't like what you're looking at. Like, for it's sure. Like, the music can't save it. <laughs> yeah. Number 20, Tales from Earthsea. Um, like I said, it wasn't a bad movie. Not a bad movie, no. Um, just sloppy. Very sloppy in terms of the story execution. Characters not fully developed, but animation's gorgeous. True. Number 19, Pompoko. I did not like that one yeah. either. Long. Long, drawn out. Drawn out. That, sh- that would have been a great short film. Make it 60 minutes. Um, I 30 think he- minutes. Okay, maybe 30. <laughs> um, I think it could have been very effective. I actually think the ending is the best part. I think that's the most interesting part of the movie. And I actually was like, that should have been the movie. Like, tell me that story of raccoons trying to live amongst humans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I yeah it's it's on the bottom. It's bottom tier for me. Um, 18 and 17 are really close. They could kind of flip flop for me for 18. I put the cat returns. Um, I've seen that movie probably more than any other Ghibli film because Addie is obsessed with it, or at least she used to be. She really liked it. Watched it all the time. Um, and it's fun. I got to admit cat returns is one of the funniest ones. I actually get a few laughs every time I see it. Um, especially the absurdity of the cat kingdom. Yes. Um, great, great voice acting too. Laugh. Yes. So I think it's like <clears throat> as a parent and your kid loves it so much and they want to watch it all the time. You just get to a point where you don't want to watch it anymore. Yeah, you're like, exactly. I, I, yeah. If I'm going to sit down and watch a movie with you, I don't want to yeah. watch this one again. Yeah. But at least <laughs> it's short, you know, so it yeah. goes by quick. Um, number 17, Secret World of Arietti, which I know you oh, really I like that, that one, one, right? That's yeah. one that if they say they want to watch a movie and they want to watch that one, I'm more, I would rather watch that one than The yeah. Cat Returns because it's prettier. Yeah. It's and that, more pleasant yeah. on the eyes. That is the, yeah, animation is fantastic. And it's just... Um, it's another vibe in film, just very chill. Well, and, and it's something that you can play out because our kids, um, they like to play with little people and they like to uh, play with yeah. little things. So like you can kind of like play that type of story. Sure. You know... For days and days and days, we can play with little people and we can play and pretend yeah. that they live in our house and it's just fun. Right. So um, it's it, it, that's one of those movies that sparks creativity outside of the movie. Right, right. So that's why I like so that true. one. Number 16, one I just saw recently, um, From Up on Poppy Hill. Oh, yeah, that one was good too. Yeah, it was better than I thought it was going to be. Has yeah, it, you said, oh, this is, this is one of the worst. Or yeah, I thought it was going to be the bad. Rankings, and I watched it. I think without you, I watched it without yep, you. Yeah, I was actually the only one you saw without me. Yeah, I watched that one without you, and I remember thinking, "It's not that bad. This isn't bad at all. This is actually yeah. totally fine." Really like the so. jazzy score. It's got a nice vibe. The in the the twist um, mm-hmm. was handled better than I thought it would be. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's sweet. Actually, well, it's some genuinely it's just, sweet moments. And I, I'm a sucker for any restoration, like you know thing i mean yeah. you see the restoration of not just the building you see the physical restoration of the building but you also see the restoration of the kids and right, understanding right. where they come from and right. understanding like who his parents were understanding who her parents were and i, I i'm a sucker yeah. for anything like that so yeah no absolutely i like those type of stories number 15 only yesterday i didn't like that one it's a talk to- you're just not a big takahata fan yeah, are you just not. pompoko yamada's no, only yesterday no, no. um yeah, only yesterday it drags yes. a lot. 
But when it's good, it is good. I really like how she's trying to use these memories to try to figure out her place in the world and how the memories are kind of hazy, like the animation style. Like I love that use of that. And I, I actually think those are the best scenes in the film are, are the memory stuff more than the adult stuff. Um, yeah, but I it's, just a, think it's the themes are done better in other ones. I agree. It's good drama, but it's a, one of those films that I've never really wanted to go back and rewatch. Um, because a lot of what I get from it, I get in other Ghibli films. Okay. Even as I'm sitting here, I don't know how I'm going to do these next three. Don't worry. I'll um, change it for you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I won't this rank. Is... I'm just going to comment on your okay. rankings. That's okay. My, that's my way okay. of I, ranking. I just want to hear. I, I, I Yeah. Yeah. I would love for you to say well, as I'm ranking these, what may be your favorite Ghibli films. Like it depends your, your, on yeah. the who I'm watching it with. Just just in general. But but um okay, so I'm gonna say number fourteen is Spit it out, dude. Ponyo? Ponyo, okay. Yep. Very hard for me to say. You would put Ponyo above Arietti. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Man. I think Ponyo's way I'm better than Arietti. Yeah, you are. It's okay. I might even want to put Ponyo a little higher, but I'll leave Ponyo here at 14. I think Ponyo, I'm just mad at the mom half the movie. Yeah, you are. Like, you are terrible. Yeah. Terrible mother. <laughs> Number 13 would be Porco Rosso. I only saw that one once. Yeah. I feel like I need to rewatch that I rewatched one. it recently, and it was literally exactly where I, like, my feelings did not change on it. It did mm. not get any better. It did not get any worse. It was like, okay, this is exactly what I remember it, and I'm fine with where it's at. Yeah. Um, it's good. It's not it's not a it's not just not my favorite, you know, but it's all right. Number twelve, The Wind Rises. That's a good one. It really is a good one. And despite the ending, um, some of the things I might feel about it, rewatching That's we're it. American. Right. The rewatching it though a second time. I was just like, man, I love this love story. Mm -hmm. I love, you know, seeing him develop the planes. It's a, definitely a flawed protagonist. You see the good and you see the not so good. Mm -hmm. um, but I think our cultural so, back, I mean, think about it. It's a Japanese and a German guy that are talking about how to make warplanes to bomb America. <laughs> I yeah. mean, like, I think our cultural biases are what really for sure make it to where we can't be like, best movie ever, yeah. you well, know? Miyazaki so. didn't want to make a film that Americans will. <laughs> well, um, there you go. Yeah. But it, it just because, you know, and even though we are biased, it doesn't mean that we don't love the movie. It's still yeah. epic and yeah. wonderful. Yeah, it is still a really, and I, I can't get over the fact about what the movie has to say about dreams and Mm -hmm. And all that stuff. There's so much good stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. There's this great documentary, The Kingdom of Dreams and Madness, that talks, uh, shows them making this film in particular. So if you really want to see how Ghibli does what they do, um, that is a great thing to check out. Number 11, just barely cracking the top 10 as a runner up, Nausicaa. Really? Not in the top 10? It's close, but it's not. That's how good these movies are, though. If Nausicaa could be number 11, know, that shows you movie. how good these are, right? All right, here we go. Number 10, mm -hmm. best movie I never want to see again. Grave of the, Grave the, Fire of the Fireflies. Fireflies. Yep. Great um, movie. Yes. If you want to cry your eyes out and be be sad for yeah. weeks, that's your movie. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it didn't like shock me because it tells you in the first five minutes how it's going to end. Oh, yeah. I think it's just more of the ride well, is they're painful. Kids. Yeah. And they're kids that were our age. I mean, they're, they're yeah. kids like our kids are their age. Yeah. So that's really hard to watch yeah, as a it parent. Is. It's very it's hard. very hard. It's to not watch for the faint parent. of heart for sure. So. Um, but if you if you uh, want to become a pacifist, then watch Grave of the Fireflies. Yes. Um, number nine, Howl's Moving Castle. I like Howl's. It's yeah. just funny. Can't get over that. Can't get over yep. how funny it is. Number eight, another movie with castles. Castle in the Sky. Mm -hmm. um, another just solid experience. I would probably put Castle in the Sky lower, to be honest. Than Howl's? Yeah. 
I would watch. I would want to watch Howls before I watch Castle in the Sky. Yeah, I think Castle in the Sky is just better. Like it's better executed in terms yeah, of the story, but that. Howls is better executed in terms of characters. I'm so not real, that's why I put I'm them just side by from side. A enjoyment perspective. Yeah. Of watching a movie. Yeah. I mean, once I get to like Grave of the Fireflies, Howls, Castle in the Sky, these are all like uh, movies that I just love and adore. Like these are like yeah. like eight out of tens right now. You know, like they're yeah. just yeah. amazing. Yeah. Um, number seven. Uh, movie moved down a little bit actually with my my second rewatch of it um, when Marnie was there. That's just a sad one. It's sad, but, but it's it has it ha- and it is some restoration. There is I a certain like element of, of drama that it carries that the other Ghibli films you don't get. It deals with certain yeah. issues that you don't get in other Ghibli films, mm-hmm. and I can't get over how moving that 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 whole revelation and all that is mm-hmm. like it is an incredibly moving film yeah it's a movie where it's hard to keep your eyes dry um yeah at least I for mean, me i i i have that one lower down on my ranking okay. like that probably wouldn't be in the top 10 for me yeah just because it's not I, a movie you're like gung-ho like all right guys let's get a popcorn and watch when marnie was there no it's definitely not and, yeah, and also, i agree like um it kind of has a different view of it has almost the view of children that's different from the other ones. So in a lot of the it's other made ones, by none of the same people. It's made by none of the same people. Okay, but still, like it has like a lot of the mm. other ones are like kids, like not when you're not when you don't baby kids, like they they can rise right. to the occasion. This one is almost the not opposite, but it's like yeah, no, you're this right. Child Me- was babied. And now she's suffering. Shiz- because Suzuki of it. said that Miyazaki could not make this film. Uh huh. It it he he could not do it. Yeah. Because it just goes it like he liked like the film. You know, obviously it was made under his approval and all that mm-hmm. as Studio Ghibli film. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's not a film that gels with his world with, view, his with world a lot view. of things yeah because you can see in this film instead of the girl like kind of taking responsibility for her actions. She doesn't have to take responsibility for her actions. Like even when she's really mean to that one girl, and the mother comes. I think she does like at the that. end, though. At the end of the movie. At the end, yes, but like she never really gets reprimanded for her. I just I don't want to say like she's moody, but like her, the way she treats people, she's never reprimanded for it. She's just like allowed to be the way she is because everyone feels bad for her because of how she was raised, because her parents are dead and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's like they just kind of let her feel whatever she wants to feel. Yeah. And it and because she's allowed to feel whatever she wants to feel, it makes it worse. Yeah. And I and I think that's like something with this one where it's like it isn't until like she has this relationship with Marnie. Marnie kind of I don't want to say wakes her up, but is kind of like there's hard stuff in life. That, like, that, that's why I like it though. Is like, I like you that you can't just like some- sit there and be moody and be exactly. sad about things that like you need to wake up. That, and that, I think that's what she needed from the beginning, but no one was willing to do it. Right. And so she had to almost yeah. create this mythical person to actually tell her what the hard truth she needed to tell. Right. And so I think that one is like an interesting one because it's like the, the adults are passive in yeah. that movie. And I think that's different from the other movies where the adults have a lot more active. Role. Yeah, that's fair. Um, because she's older. She's not like five or six or 10. She looks like she's 13, right? Or right. She's older than that. Maybe. I think 12, maybe yeah. 13. She's a little bit older. Yeah. So it's like, she's learning the lesson late. Right. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I love it. I think it's a great film. It's, oh, it's, it's a different, it's a, it's a different film. flavor just a, in the yeah, Ghibli it's a canon. It's flavor. It's a I different like. type of, um, yeah. Num- number six, oh, this is hard to have this solo. It really is. Number what? six is Spirited Away. Wow, I'm surprised. I know. It just. There's so much depth, Derek. There's just so much going on, though. Like, <laughs> you know. Um, and I mean, there's like a couple of these films in my top spot that I might move slide oh down a gosh, little bit. You're going to put Spirited Away lower than Totoro. Number five is Totoro. I think Totoro is just such a unique experience yeah. in its whimsy and it's la- like, it's I, I can't think of another film really like it, mm-hmm. you know, and it just knows what it wants to do and it does it, it, does it really well. well. 
And just seeing how much delight it brings my kids makes me so happy, you know, with it. So and also I, the conversations you get to have with your kids because of it. Yeah. So I think I have to put Totoro above Spirited I Away. Totoro. I know. Um, number four, Whisper of the Heart. I love. I like yep. that one too. And and I think purely it, it, it's that high because of its message and themes. Mm-hmm. You know. And again, it's a type of film you don't really see much. So the the final three films I'm going to say are what I think are the the five star, 10 out of 10, Mm -hmm. um, what I would consider perfect Ghibli, perfect films. Number three is Kiki's Delivery Service. I love Kiki. Yep. Yep. I do. Yep. We've gushed about it. I think it's 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 amazing. Number two. Well, and also with Kiki is it's not like, it's not really a film that like, if you go into it with like having these crazy expectations. Yes. Yes. You're going to be disappointed. I agree. But because it's like, you think, oh, she's a witch. It's going to be interesting. And then you realize, oh, yeah, she's a witch. But like, it, she feels more like a girl that happens to have like fairy likeness, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah, for sure. Like it's not like a creepy witch. It's not right. like a magicalness. It's like her mom. Her mom. I think of the first scene. Like is making potions mm-hmm. to cure arthritis. Yeah. Like it, it's like it's so like innocent in that right, aspect. Right, right. And then she's like, yeah, she's got magic in her. But like, what is she gonna do? She's like, I don't know what to do with magic. What can I do? Well, I guess I can fly. Right. Okay, right. Well, what should I do? How can I use flying? It's not like I can carry people on my broom. I can carry packages <laughs> oh what a great idea like it's just so sweet yeah and it's just yeah yeah Keep no i i agree great. with that all right tori number two hmm. probably most controversial for you on the list what number two tale of the princess kaguya Ugh. i know i don't like that movie um go ahead gush about it and then i'll um, rip it to pieces <laughs> no i won't the, I mean, I've never seen an, a film entirely animated with watercolor. That so, is gorgeous. Um, I'll admit and that. And the fact that they did all that by hand is pretty astonishing. And I, I mean, the film took eight years to make, wow. which is the record of any Ghibli film. It is also the most expensive film ever made in Japan, Time even is including money. live action. So, did it make um, money? No, it was a bomb. It did terrible. Um, it was. It, it it is the only Ghibli movie to have a hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes, but it did not make much money um but nonetheless um it's adapting one of the oldest stories in japanese folklore but it's bringing some modern kind of sensibilities and ideas to it um i love the idea that it's a a story about trying to find what's what's precious in life even when you're in suffering and even when you know that death is coming um, and of course, Takahata passes away after making this film. So there's mm-hmm. kind of like a poetry to it all. Yeah. There's, this is the only Ghibli film that actually has a documentary about like an hour and a half documentary about how it was made it besides, eight years besides when make. rises. Yeah. The documentary definitely is really eye opening as well. Just to see like, uh, you know, the little things like how Takahata wanted the animation to have imperfections in it left intentionally in there mm-hmm. to acknowledge imperfections in life, to um, to have an ending where life doesn't resolve or where it, there's no resolution. Um, the final song of the movie uh, was sang by somebody who, as they were singing it, when they recorded it, they were eight months pregnant. And they wrote this song about the beauty and the f- um, fragileness of life um, as they had life growing within them. So this is a movie that when you analyze it and when you really get into how much went into every frame, I mean, and I still think there's certain moments in this film, like uh, like the scene of Kaguya breaking out of the home and running and running and the animation losing out of control. Like she's trying to escape the narrative. There are that those are moments that are unparalleled in any film I've ever seen. Like, I don't think I've ever seen 
a moment like that in a film where a character is trying to leave, like leave break away, like the frustrate, like, like that book you read forever ago, the people of paper. Yeah. It does remind me of people of paper yeah. actually, where it's like, and you have like the moon, which I don't want to give away what the moon is and what it ties in, but you have like this howling, like almost like omnipresent force. That's just beating down throughout mm-hmm. the, f- it's a brutal film. It's not a light watch, despite how the first 15 minutes trick you into thinking it's going to be a happy movie. Yeah. It is incredibly brutal. Um, it is tough, tough drama. But it is a film experience that I don't think I can compare it to anything else. Maybe it's such a beautiful day. Maybe that's the closest I can compare it to in terms of a film experience. But it really is, again, and Ghibli standards also unique in what they offer and number one wait what i don't like princess guy i know (laughs) why don't you like it tori because it's a story about the stripping of one's identity yes it is and how it leads to destruction and death yes it is and how there's nothing you can do about it yes it is it's a story of powerlessness actually i think she does she does try to take some some and power fails. back. No, she literally doesn't get married. She doesn't get these these. Yeah, I guess she doesn't have to be married to him. You know. Mm-hmm. But there's this idea that that and it's baked within the movie as well. But there's this idea of immortality makes life not presser, precious. Is that kind of the idea? Or well, it's interesting. That's kind of what it feels like in Kaguya. It's well, like, it's interesting because in the original story, it's told a little differently. So that way, like um, the original story is actually against Kaguya, the narrative wise. Okay. They're actually siding with the Moon People. Okay. So it's actually a story about how you should not have attachments. I see. And how. Kaguya is wrong to try to leave the bliss of Nirvana and try to live life on earth. Mm -hmm. We should all be trying to get to Kaguya where we forget all the pains of life and live in bliss. That's the moral of the original story. Well, I disagree with that moral too. Takahata does too. He flips it and he says, no, Kaguya is right. Mm -hmm. Life is worth living Mm -hmm. and the moon people are wrong. We shouldn't be on this quest for immortality. Mm-hmm. Um, of trying to sustain this ner- infinite nirvana where we just can't feel anymore. Mm-hmm. So Takahata is taking the original story and he's completely flipping the theme. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, but I still don't like the movie. It's itself. understandable. So It's understandable. And number one is Princess Mononoke, which is probably a top 10 film for me of all time. Mm-hmm. It's it's everything that like a Lord of the Rings and Narnia, like all those fantasy epics are made of, but somehow manages to do it in just a little over two hours Mm -hmm. and is so intricate and there's so much going on, so many deep themes, so much I could analyze and dissect, but also a lot to enjoy too. characters, um, like one of those animation. Epics, except for it's not a clear-cut good versus evil. Right. Yeah. So that's just about going to do it. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite Ghibli film? Probably Totoro. Probably Totoro. Yeah. Totoro is a lot of people's favorite, But that's also the phase of life I'm in with young kids, too. So, you know. You might get old and cynical like Miyazaki and... Maybe When Rises will be your favorite one. Who knows? That's the thing. Who knows? I really, really do like a lot of those other films. Um, I think I already, while you were ranking, I kind of went through them as well. Yeah. So if you haven't checked out these films, you definitely should. It's worth it. The investment and the time. And, um, if you haven't checked out all things narrative, we are also worth the time and the (laughs) investment. Um, you check us out all things narrative.com for our coaching packages for, um, or sorry, for our coaching program, Live a Meaningful Story, for any workshops and classes that we're doing, which we will start offering virtually soon, so stay tuned for that. And of course, um, you can return right back to this podcast where we've got new episodes always coming. So if you love story, then you are in the right place. So Tori, thank you so much for staying up. So Tori and I are going to bid you all farewell. Thank you so much for joining the All Things Narrative podcast, Why We Love Studio Ghibli, and we will be back 
in December for another round of great episodes to close out the year. What's December? Ah, you will have to wait and see. Really? You're not going to tell me? Where do we build up from Studio Ghibli, right? Yeah. Well, I'll give you a hint. We don't build anywhere. We kind of, uh, we kind of, uh, slide down. No, we kind of lounge around a little bit. Mm. So we kind of vibe and yeah, you'll, you'll see what I mean. So thank you so much. And until then, take care. <laughs>